set it up in an emulator so I could fuzz it in an emulator. And that's it. <laughs> so I took like a live snapshot of an iOS device and moved it into, I think I literally used QMU for that. Um, but that was just kind of like a fun project I did with a friend. I didn't actually do much on that. So, yeah. Okay. Plan on doing Hackintosh? I've never done Hackintosh. I don't know how well that works, to be honest. Okay, let's see. Stop, reset. Okay. Drinking water or wine? Both. <laughs> Both. At equal volumes. <laughs> I gotta set up my uh, TBA characters quick here. The server save and I logged out. Oh, I lost my parcel. Fuck. Okay. All right. I sounded like a large sip. Yeah, that was just water. <laughs> that one. That one was water. I have killed this bottle of wine, so I would have to either open a new bottle of wine, or uh, or be done with wine for the night. So we'll see. We'll see how that pans out. <laughs> brought out the wine like 20 minutes ago. No, that's been going That's been going pretty much non-stop. Will you upload later on YouTube? Yes, I always do. Okay. So range set is basically a library that allows me to have a set of ranges. And in this case, it's all 64-bit ranges such that I can represent the entire physical address space. Uh, YouTube, bang, how the fuck do I not have bang YouTube? Are you kidding me, me? How lazy am I? Uh, I upload all of my streams as VODs. Okay. <laughs> I do have a GitHub, okay. But there's the YouTube link. I don't have fucking Twitter. Oh my god. How do I not have Twitter? Twitter is like the only way I communicate with people. Uh, that is that is like my only public facing image is Twitter. Okay, Twitter. I do have one in panel, I think, but not here. There we go. Uh, I did add the twit. I think the Twitter's in the panel. Bang Maple Story. <laughs> Bang TV. Oh fuck! God damn it! So many commands. Uh, let's see, Tibia. I'm currently. Uh, I am probably training on Retro Cores Ammonia at the moment. Character name is Rana. Okay. Tibia, done. Um, what else? What else was requested as a command? Maple story. Maple story. I uh, will. Okay. Maple story added. I do have fuzzing. You su fucking surprised by that? <laughs> glasses prescription. I don't even know what my glasses are. <laughs> Port maple story to Linux. I I've done that. 
<laughs> my ma my maple story cheats ran on Linux. <laughs> That's done. <laughs> Literally, the maple story hacks that I used were a, it was a completely custom maple story client that ran on Linux, and I scaled it out to fucking the cloud, and I would log in with like hundreds of accounts, and they would all bot for me. And they would instantly, like, teleport and give me all of their items every, like, ten minutes. <laughs> it was fucking great. It's definitely the best hack I've ever written for a game. It, it was just, it's, literally, there's, like, nothing better I can do. It, it was, it, it's a complete cheat. It's done. Alright, I gotta grab a parcel quick. Cause I didn't pick my parcel up. Yeah, yeah. I uh, Maple Story is kind of a done deal. I mean, I had a lot of fun doing that, and I might go revisit that. Those were the days, man. <sighs> All right. So range set. Range set. I need to buy this parcel quick. Uh, hi, parcel. Yes. So range set is basically a collection of non-overlapping sets of ranges. In this case, uh, U64 to U64, where this is an inclusive range. And the reason we did an in inclusive range is that allows you to have a range that includes all Fs. Because if you do lengths, you can't actually express that because if you add the, um, if you add the base, oops, uh, let's get that working quick. Okay, fixed. And I am chaining again. So the reason that I do inclusive range in ranges instead of uh, like a base plus length is you can't do a base plus length if you have a, um, let's say I wanted to have all of memory mapped in all the, the entire 64 bit adder space. In that case, the start would be at zero, but then the length, would actually be 2 to the 64, which you can't express in a 64-bit number. So this entire library is designed around inclusive ranges, and it basically uh, gives you the ability to insert a range where you can add a new range, and if there are overlaps, it will merge all of the ranges that are next to each other, and then you also can remove a range. And if you remove a range, uh, it will split up an existing range if you fragged one. It will truncate one if you just cut off the end. And that's why this was relatively difficult to write, because I have to deal with all of the situations where you might end up fragmenting a range. So what I think I'm going to do is I'm probably going to copy this code, but I'm probably going to uh, rewrite like all of the comments. And we'll go through and we'll read it, and we'll make sure that it looks sane. I've used this code for a while, so it's good code. It's all contained in a nice library. Uh, ConstFN is no longer a feature. There's a bunch of bunch of crazy things. So let's uh, we're gonna make a um, we're gonna go to shared cargo new lib range set. Okay. So we'll split sort uh, shared range set source lib. Y1000, paste, delete, delete constfn. This doesn't need to be packed. And then we'll restylize a lot of stuff to use the style that I use in modern day. Uh, so let's pull this in. So we're going to make use range set range set. And we'll split bootloader cargo toml. We'll add a dependency on range set. Okay, so now we have range set as a dependency, and sweet. All right, borrow of a packed field. Yeah, because we marked everything as packed because I'm a fucking dumbass. Because back in the day, I only knew how to do packed things. Anyway, that you can publish your Vim config. It's just the stock one. Uh, user share Vim. Vim, VimRC, it's, uh, it's literally, it's Vim example, VimRC under example, 
and then I add this shit to it. But you know what? Since enough fucking people ask, <laughs> I will add it. Um, Vimercy. Okay. VMRC. All right, I did it. <laughs> what model of gamer chair? Herman Miller Arion chair. I don't believe in gamer chairs. I don't think they're good. I think they're a gimmick. Uh, if you write a lot of Rust code, you might want to add auto completion. I fucking hate auto completion. I love my Vim being bone stock, and I like my editor to be literal. I really hate when it tries to be smart and it like spews my screen or lags or delays when it's trying to auto populate or fill things in. I, it's just, it's so cumbersome. In the 1% of times where it's actually useful and displays something that I don't know or would have to look up, there are 9,000 other cases where it's just literally getting in the way and adding delay and bloat. I hate auto-completion because it never fucking works and it's always slow and it always bloats kind of the interface. So this is... Uh, actually, we can use... Can we use the range directly from Rust? I think it wasn't stable last time I did this. Um... Let's go to uh, rust up doc, grab this, whack this over here, and we're gonna search for range. So the range is used to in Rust not be something that you could instantiate, I think. So here I can make it a range inclusive. This is in core. I'm pretty sure I can get this in core, so let's see. Tab 9 uses 15k lines of code. That's way too much. My whole window manager uses 1k line of code. <laughs> I recognize it's probably not too bad, but I don't know. It's just something I don't like too much. Okay, so these are constant functions now. So that works. And that's constant. And that's constant. I think we can actually switch this to use range inclusives now. We previously weren't able to do that, but I think now we can. Um, unless there was a reason that I did my own range, but I don't think so. So we'll use uh, use core ops range inclusive. And that takes a templated type, doesn't it? It takes a index type. So this is going to be a range set, which will have a range inclusive of a U size. Actually, a U64. Beautiful. 10K line of code for auto complete. <laughs> it's pretty imp uh, impressive how good tab 9 is. Still knowing if you don't like normal auto complete. I've never liked auto complete. I've never liked IDEs. I mean, part of it is I want to be elite, right? And you don't look leet if you have autocomplete on. Um, but a lot of it is just years and years and years of, exper like, not experience, of using this environment. And this is what I like. I used VS Code for about a year, a year ago. And I switched back to Vim. And I realized how, wor how much worse my VS Code development was. Like, I just, I use find and replace so much in Vim. I use all of that shit all the time. My keyboard keys are all blank, so are mine. <laughs> it's not by choice. It's literally the only DOS keyboard that was in stock when I bought it. But I haven't needed to have numbers on my keyboard. <laughs> it's, it's like, I, I don't know. I find it surprising how many people actually need numbers and letters on their keyboard because I, I feel like I haven't needed that since I was quite young but 
I, at work, I also have another one of these DOS keyboards that doesn't have numbers. And when someone, like, uses my keyboard, it's really weird to see them struggle to, like, find where fucking keys are. <laughs> I don't understand that. <laughs> like, how do you not know how to touch type if you're fucking employed at Microsoft? <laughs> how is that not a thing? <laughs> I... <laughs> That being said, being able to touch type doesn't make you more or less capable of writing code. So it should not be a factor, right? But I'm just surprised. <laughs> no, they're they're like coworkers. It's it's interesting. A lot of people, I guess, don't touch type. Especially I think it's mainly for like all of the um all of the uh whatever you want to call these symbols. For the, like, symbols, a lot of people don't know. But it's just weird, because I'm so used to, like, coding. Like, I will just know where all of these are. I might not know... I can't probably point you on the keyboard where the pound key is. But I can type include any day. <laughs> so, like, it's there. I can type a currency. <laughs> I can type an exclamation point. That's easy. So, like, I don't know. It's just... Yeah. All the, all the braces, I know where all those are because I type those literally a billion times an hour. Except pound that, yeah. So I have dollar sign percent as well, like ASDF mod 5, like that I'm pretty used to. What else do we have? Pound at, well that's easy. Anyone should know how to do ats for emails. Percents for mods, yep, I know that for xors. Ands for ands. Star for multiply, open and close paren, all the square brackets, like, you use all these characters when you program, so you just get used to them. Okay, so this is a uh, libra library which provides a uh, range set which contains uh, non-overlapping sets of use 64 inclusive ranges this uh the range sets can be used to insert or remove ranges whoop, ranges of uh, u64s and thus is very useful for physical memory management okay no standard. So this is uh, a set of non-overlapping inclusive uh, U64 ranges. <laughs> How to be lead? God damn it! You can really clip that. <laughs> what is this practice called when you put your fingers on the home row and don't move your hand for typing? Ah. Uh. Okay. IDEs are better than text editors if they're fast. Yeah, problem is I've never seen a fast IDE in my life. VS Code came close and it was still slow as balls. Visual Studio takes five hours to load. JetBrains, code blocks all take five hours to open a single text file. I think IDEs, I think IDEs pr allow developers to be lazy and they stop learning how they formatted their code base and IDEs allow people to write the shittiest fucking code because no one actually navigates the code based on the file and source layout. They navigate via extracts. And if you navigate via xrefs, you stop forgetting about the fact that you're 150,000 line, lines deep in a single file. Or you're in the ninth Java factory factory factory. And you really start relying on the IDE to tell you where code is. 
And I think what you should do is you should take a step back and you should organize your code and develop in a way that it's intuitive and it makes sense where you put your code and it's easy to navigate. I'm doing everything in Vim here and I know exactly where every single fucking function is in this code base hit. Uh, I recognize this is a tiny code base, but I also do this for large, you know, 40, 50k line of code code bases. I, like, look, I, I recognize that 99% of developers out there are either not interested in the code that they produce or they're motivated by money or they're motivated by getting a promotion or motivated, motivated by appealing to their boss or whatever the fuck it is that causes people to want to write code as fast as humanly possible. And yeah, you want to use auto IDEs and autocomplete and you want to have everything just automatically fucking work and you want to have like hotkeys that will automatically create a boilerplate file with the right templates in the right environment and pre-compiled headers and all this shit to make your life easier. But you end up in these environments where you can't build your code. You can't understand what your shit's actually doing because it's so fucking convoluted. And I hate that about like CI pipelines too, where people have build environments in CI pipelines where the build server, the one fucking cloud core that they have dedicated to building their thing is the only goddamn computer in the world that will ever be able to build that software because it relies on a specific version of a billion libs in specific absolute paths, in specific systems, on specific builds of Windows, with specific compilers, with specific libc environments. I just don't understand how that's a thing. What are you possibly doing in your code base where you're relying on like a specific version of libc? And I see this shit all the time. I write fucking operating systems and I don't rely on specific versions of things. Like, what are you doing? Are you reading the change logs for every weekly release from a code base and you're immediately using every feature it has? It's mind fucking boggling. If it's not in libc in like 1985 and before, I'm probably not gonna use it. <laughs> I don't know why, but your voice is starting to sound like Casey's. Well, I was just slouching my chair. I was pretty much at a, a 120 degree obtuse angle in my chair. I have now uh, promptly. <laughs> I've I've set up in my chair now. Let's uh let's write some fucking code. I don't know. I just <laughs> I recognize I'm very privileged, but I've had the ability in my life, and I recognize a lot of people can't fucking do this, and I feel bad saying this, but I've had the ability to never really write code in a way that I don't approve of. I've never really had a situation where I haven't been able to step back and refactor something, regardless of whatever the fucking constraints are. I've always had the funding, I've always had bosses who support it, I've always had groups or teams that allow that environment, and it just allows me to focus on writing good code, not focusing on releasing, getting out to users, making the biggest possible fucking impact. It's just working on writing the best goddamn code I'm capable of producing. <laughs> Don't say you write good code until you're done refactoring this library. <laughs> ah, all right, we already changed this to use range inclusive. And I feel like there might be a reason why we did that. And I think it was for const. And I think it was because I see a const right here. And this did previously rely on const fn. And this was not const two years ago or whenever I wrote this shit. Fuck yeah. So we're going to do a range. All right, curly braces. When I'm writing C, I put very verbose curly braces on new lines. In Rust, I actually like them on the same line. It's something 
Something that I kind of like in Rust. I don't know why. In C, I don't like it. In C, I like the extra white space. But in Rust, I do like the density. Uh, so this is a start end. Zero, zero. In use is zero. Oh, yeah. And this whole library is also on a fixed size of 32 uh, entries allowed in this range set. Um, and that's required because we don't have an allocator when we're making our allocator. <clears throat> I went blind when he went from Vim to Chrome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is there a dark mode for this? <laughs> oh, I was not expecting that. <laughs> Is that a permanent change? Will it remember that? <laughs> it actually kind of looks like shit. I don't like this dark. I wish it was darker, and I don't like that this search box is still white. Oh, God. Fuck. What are the keyboard shortcuts? Man, I've got a lot of features here. Yes. Yes. So that means I can now do range inclusive, and I will go directly to it. Well, yeah, core ops. <sighs> okay, not quite. But this, okay, nice. All right. I do like that glow. That's kind of cool. Whoever designed the Rust doc style, it is amazing. Dude, who the fuck came up with the Java doc style? Who thought that the javadoc style documentation was even remotely sane? Are you fucking kidding me? Even even when that was designed in 1995, we knew how to make websites better than that shit. Oh my god. Yeah, can I put this in dark mode or some shit? Like the whole browser and things respect that? Okay. So make a range set. This range set in use is set to zero. That means nothing is currently being used in the range set. Now we should probably make a fixed vec library and we could bring one of those in and then we could use a fixed vector for these rather than manually doing it here. Um, but we'll think about that. Okay, entries. This is going to give a list of all of the valid entries in here. This is gonna be a range inclusive U64 and we're just gonna slice down the ranges. Uh, yeah, there we go. Oh, shit. Does that not include... Is that why? Range inclusive doesn't implement copy? Are you kidding me? It's two numbers! It's... It's two... Why is that? Oh, okay, there's a reason for it. <laughs> Rust Lang Rust issues this. First fucking try. Drive copy. don't have it because they're iterators. Decided in the past to not do this. The fuck? I guess that is to prevent things from getting explicitly moved. Fuck off! Well, I guess we're not using range inclusive then. See? They have reason for it. Fuck, and we had all our comments and shit too? God damn. Uh, pub, start, end. 
frustrating, man. Don't do that. I mean, it makes sense, but I'm still unhappy about it. Uh, this is going to be a... Uh, an inclusive range. We do not use range inclusive as it does not implement copy. <sighs> okay, range new. Yeah, in this case, we can just do start and pub for both of these fields. Time to switch back to C++. I've never been doing C++, so there's no back to C++. Even when I was 12 years old, I knew that language was shit. Sorry, Bjorn, but your language is kind of ass. Okay. Modern C++ is not too bad. Yeah, but if you're using modern C++, you, you've already committed to using a modern tool chain, so just use a real language like Rust. Or Go. Or Python. Or JavaScript. Something that's a fucking safe language. Kappa. <laughs> that means C11 and up. Yeah, yeah Rust, Rust was uh, roughly coming around in that JavaScript is a real language. All right, let's 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 read this fucking code, guys. All right, delete. This is going to delete the range contained in the range set at index. It's going to assert that the index is less than in use. Okay, otherwise it will panic. Cool, I'm okay with that. Then we will go through all of the ranges from self in use as u size minus one. I'm I'm comfortable with that syntax now. Um, go through and we're gonna swap all the ranges. So we remove the range at index. God damn, I'm good. Yeah, go through index two in use minus one and swap them, and that will cause the last one to get to put to the end, and then we decrement in use. That's fucking great. That's fucking great. This is uh um copy the deleted range out of the uh to the end of the list. So I'm gonna swap, 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 swap. Real language like Rust, 90% of it is unsafe wrappers. Aha! Uh -huh. Yeah, it turns out you have to write unsafe code to make a language because computers are inherently unsafe. What do you, what do you expect there? <laughs> do you expect that like the x86 processor is just gonna execute your stuff? And uh, do you think this is Giselle on ARM processors where you run Java directly on on uh, on the core, decrement the number of valid ranges. Oh! If in use is zero, oh, that we protect against that. If it is empty, we do protect against that. That's good. They're dedicated Java CPUs. <laughs> Giselle. <laughs> Giselle, man. Giselle is where it's at. Okay, here we're going to insert a new range into the range set. If the range overlaps with an existing range, comma, then the ranges will be merged. God damn, I didn't know how to use fucking commas when I was a kid. If the range has no overlap with an existing range, then it will be simply be added to the set. I don't even know if comma is supposed to be there. Java isn't as cool as Lisp. Lisp. Uh, assert that the start is prior to the end. Invalid range shape. Cool. Outside loop forever until we run out of merges with existing ranges. Okay, so this is the try merges. Cool, and we used a loop label. Wow. We're going to go through every single... We're going to go through every single range in our range. 
And let's see, is there a reason why we're not using the iterator here? And I think there might be, because we probably modify that, and it looks like we do. So here we're going to go through every single range. We're going to get the existing range that's going to copy it, which is free. If there is no overlap with this range, then continue. If there is overlap, then it means that this range overlapped with an existing range. And we can go down here and look at these. We'll clean these up a little bit. Make sure that x, yep, this is just checking for overlaps. Uh, this makes sure, this normalizes the uh, ranges. Turn true. Um, yeah, we're going to do this. Okay. This one, we're going to do the same thing. True, else, false. Wow. Old me did not know how to use uh, fucking expressions, did I? Is the code good? Yeah, this code looks pretty good. Make sure that x2 is always greater than x1, so we swap them. So this is going to normalize them to make sure that they're always in the order we expect. And then this is checking for if it's contained. So returns true if the entirety of x1 to x2 inclusive is contained inside y1, y2, else returns false. And this one determines if the two uh, ranges have any overlap. Once again, inclusive ranges. So what we're doing up here is we're saying if there's no overlap, nice, and we're using saturated ads. Is that correct here? Um, please, please replace the if else with the predicate. You mean like this? <laughs> yeah, that probably makes fucking sense. <laughs> um, well, you shouldn't be too harsh on Java. Some, sometimes writing one code base that runs on multiple platforms is what you want. Yeah, that's fair. You could use a real language like Rust that runs on multiple platforms as well. Um... But uh, I'm, I'm kidding. Java's been around for a long fucking time. You're kind of forced, like, if you've wanted to do cross-compatible code for the past, like, 20 years, you pretty much have to do Java. Especially if you want to be able to ship uh, binaries. You don't want to ship source. Like, the open source community has it easy. Yeah, you can just build anything for any architecture, and that's easy. But uh, it turns out that's pretty hard on a lot of other environments. Okay, let's see if this is doing this logic right. And it, it probably is. This is checking if range start overlaps with saturating end. And why do we do that? Well, good thing I wrote a fucking comment. Note that we do a saturated add of one to each range. This is done so that two ranges that are touching but not overlapping will be combined. Yeah, I'm fucking brilliant. So basically, if you have two ranges that are right next to each other, this will make sure that this counts as overlapping, and this will cause the ranges to get slurped in together. And we do saturating add, because that will mean that we saturate at the limits of the U64s. Okay, so there's overlap with an existing range. Make this range a combination of the existing ranges. So we update the... Uh, oh, what are we doing? Yeah, we're updating this range, and we're combining this with the existing range. So the existing range we delete, delete the existing range, and then we merge the lower between the starts and the highest between the ends. And now we have a superset of those ranges. And then here, we're going to start looking for merges, or start over looking for merges. And then here we break if we weren't able to find any more merges to do, whatever. So this is going to go and find any ranges that were potentially touching and that's why we do the saturating add, such that if there are two ranges that this would be right adjacent to that we actually combine with that range because it's a, a contiguous range. Um, what's up? Uh, 
how are you? Oh, we got a we got a we got a nice spammer here. Nice. I'm gonna give that a nice little uh boop. Okay. Is Go really that good? I mean, I don't do any non-systems development, so I have no use for Go. But uh, I think Go is a great language. I don't like it compared to Rust, and I would never really write Go over Rust, even if I'm doing a userland application, but I still think it's a good language. Um, a few quirks, mostly awesome. No generics yet. Yeah, that kind of sucks. How does it compare? A little bit slower, yeah. Uh, is there any case where there's no space left to insert? Uh, what do you mean? Like, in this case, the insert is fine. This insert is just an or. This is just a union, right? This isn't actually... This isn't finding a free set. This is just adding something and then combining it into the range. If that makes sense. Okay. So that logic looks fantastic. Then in this case, if... Yeah, I was really afraid of casts before. Um, okay, I was not... Uh, I was right to be afraid of casts. Uh, <laughs> um, <coughs> uh, okay, so if the in use is less than that, uh, oh, assert that it's less than that, otherwise there's out of room to insert, then we're going to add this range to the end. Done. So we're going to put this range at this location, self in use. And then we're going to update in use. Looks fucking great. I don't see any bugs here. And we reformatted all this code. I'm going to make a... Uh, I'm going to make a search for this. So we make sure we replace all those. Okay. Remove range from the range set. Any range in the range set which overlaps with range will be trimmed such that there is no more overlap. If this results in our range... Uh, in a range in the set becoming empty, the range will be removed entirely from the set. Brilliant. We validate the shape. Here we're going through, we're trying subtractions. So we're going to go through all the ranges. If there is no overlap, there's nothing to do with this range. That is true. We can't remove anything from a range with no overlap. If this entry is entirely contained by the range to remove, so here we have... If this entry is contained entirely in this, then we delete it, which makes sense. We're going to remove the entire range, so we just nuke that entire range. At this point, we know that there's overlap, but only partial. This means we need to adjust the size of the current range and potentially insert a new entry if the entry is split in two. Okay. So if the range we want to remove... If the range we want to remove starts prior to the entry that we're updating, that means that the overlap is on the low end. Yep, that makes sense. And thus, we adjust the start of the range to the end of the range we want to remove. Perfect. Yeah. And then here, it's actually really good. I'm, I'm really impressed by this code quality, to be honest. I actually remember writing this. I wrote this on a vacation, and I write really good code on vacations. Um, if the overlap is on the high end of the range, if the range we want to remove exceeds the end, that means that the start uh, is where the overlap is, in which case we're going to grab the start of the range. We're going to subtract 1, and that's going to be the end of the new range. Yep, because we don't want to include that. In this case, we do the sat training as well. And then in this case, the range fits inside. In this case, we will set the start of this range will become the end of the range we're removing, plus one, because we're removing that byte inclusive. We're going to make sure that we have room for another entry. We're going to allocate a new entry yeah, because we update the starting point of that. Uh, 
Yeah, we update the start to the end. So this new range is the tail part. And then we have the forward part of this range, which starts at the entry start point that we just killed. And it goes to the range that we're removing, start minus one. And that's true. So we will cleave that into two separate ranges. So we'll introduce a new set and we'll split those apart. Looks fucking great. And then that will break when we're done with subtractions. And it looks like every time we remove something or add something, we just go to retry in case we have to continue refragging. There's technically better algorithms here, but this is just really simple. And I'm comfortable with this being 100% correct. Okay, in this case, we're going to subtract a range set from self. Here, we're going to say range set. Pretty straightforward. Go through every single entry, everything in the range set, and remove it from self. In this case, we're going to compute the size of the range covered by this range set. We're going to go through every single entry. We're going to fold them into U64. We're going to add the end minus the start plus one. Awesome. Technically, there can be overflow there. Uh, there cannot be overflow here because we'll never have something that violates this. Uh, but this plus one could violate if we have a full set. So let's fix that. Uh, basically, if we have a, a zero to FFF, this is max int, and then we add one to it. So here we'll do a checked add one. Expect integer overflow on uh, range set sum. Okay, so we'll take, we know since this, this we have the checked add. This add will not have an overflow ever, I don't think. If we have a one, bunch of, yeah, I don't think so. It cannot. Worst case scenario is we only have one range. If we have two ranges, there's one byte missing, which means we won't have an overflow. Uh, n minus start plus one, that's the size. That can potentially fail. And then we accumulate that and return the sum. Looks great. Check dad, now that's a cool ad. Yeah, check dad is amazing, man. Love it, love it, love it, love it. And we'll put one of these bad boys here. Get rid of the semi. Okay. And that is always fine. And then this one is checked. And then this one will not overflow. Yeah, it can overflow. Yep. If the range is the zero to max value, correct. And that's what this check is. So this will now panic if that happens. I could make this return an option. Um, let's do that. It makes it a little bit more versatile. And the code cost is the same. Uh, actually, we can't do that because we're in fold. We can't return out early in that case. Because we're in a closure. I mean, we could break it out and do the ads ourselves. Yeah, we're just going to panic. Otherwise, we'd have to do a for loop ourselves. I think this is fine. OK, this is allocate size bytes with a line requirement for alignment. Oh, nice. So I have an allocator. Um, overlaps, those are all cleaned up to the right format. So allocate actually will allow me to allocate size bytes with a specific alignment out of this. So obviously, this ring set is designed for allocations. Now, it shouldn't be returning a mutable pointer. Um, it should just return a U size, or a U64 in this case. So a return value of null returns uh, represents an error. Let's, uh, let's change that. Let's say an option. Uh, validate that the alignment is non-zero and a power of 2. Cool. So if a line count zeros is not equal to one, then we're going to return none. Trifold. There's fucking trifold. Really? 
I feel like I've read that before. How fucking cool is that? Uh, what the fuck is that? You have to do sum on the, on the init value? Or do I have to wrap this in sum? You sure? You sure? Oh, the lambda body. Oh, here. That. And then get rid of this sum. Yeah. Uh. What did I, what, what, what delimiter did I kill? All right, now I'm struggling. Unclosed on the sum. What? Expected U64 found. Oh, I scrolled back too far? Oh, I fixed it. Yeah, thank you. Woof! <sighs> That's why I clear sometimes. But not in that case. <laughs> I was about to say, this looks about right. Okay. Um, validate that the alignment is non-zero and a power of two. Cool. Count ones. If it's not equal to one, if there's not a single one, then it's zero, or they're multiple and it's not a power of two. Do you like that check right there? Isn't that fucking gorgeous? Zero size allocations... Imagine spending 30 minutes debugging a non-existing filer. I'm sure I've done that before. Zero size allocations get one byte allocated. Uh, do we care? I don't know if I care. I might return error on uh, an empty... Now, there's probably a reason, because I, I normally start restricted, and then I go relaxed. Um, if size is zero, return none. Uh, don't allow allocations of zero size. But I'm just fine with that, to be honest. That might be an issue when I go to allocate a zero size type. But if I go to allocate a zero size type, I maybe should specialize it at the location of that. And I don't wanna, yeah, I don't wanna use a byte for a zero size type. That's very C oriented to do that sort of shit. This is rust, we have, we have actual errors. Okay, generate a mask for the specified alignment. Well, this is safe because we know that alignment is non-zero and a power of two. We subtract one and we have a mask. We can now go through each memory range in the range set. And we're going to start off with an allocation. Let's see if we can do a... Uh, we could probably do a loop with a break. Yeah, let's see. So determine the number of bytes required uh, for front padding to satisfy alignment requirements. So assuming... Requirements. So assuming that we used this entry that we're looking at, we're going to compute the... Uh, alignment fix up that would be required. And then we're going to compute the base and end of the allocation as an inclusive range base and end. And what are we returning? We're going to return an option U size, I think. And you'll see why in a second. So, yeah, this is exactly why. <laughs> We're going to validate that the allocation is addressable in the current processor state. This will cause us to skip trying to allocate out of 64-bit memory if we cannot use a 64-bit address in the current stage. 
And we might want to make this as a flag such that we can allocate out of 64-bit memory for the next stage. I think this is fine. We should be able to get by with this. So we take the alignment. We subtract off the... Yeah. We subtract off the mod with the entry start. And then we mask that with a line mask. And yeah, that'll give us the number of bytes that we need for front padding. So then here, we're going to compute the base and end of the allocation as an inclusive range. So we start out with entry start, and then we go to checked add, size minus one, because we're doing inclusive. Um, here we can actually just do a question mark, get rid of these unwraps. So the end is the base plus the size minus one plus the alignment fix. And the alignment fix can be zero if the alignment already matches what we want. I'd return null pointer as zero. Yeah. OK. So in this case, we compute the base and the end based on the inclusive range. Then we validate, because this is as U64s, we validate that the base is if the base is greater than u size max or the end is greater than u size max, then we know that we actually can't use this allocation. Um, and that's true. If it's equal to u size max for both of those, it's fine. So if the base or the end exceeds the u size max, technically we can only check, we only have to check the end, but I like the verbosity of that, quite frankly. So we'll keep it. Um, then here, check that this entry has enough room to satisfy the allocation. So if the end exceeds, is greater than the current entry's end, then we don't have enough room in this entry. Otherwise, at this point, we were able to find an entry that wholly contains what we need. So we're going to create an allocation, which is going to be a base, an end, of the allocation and then the base plus the align fix as a mute u8. So that's the actual address here. So this will be the um, this will be the actual address that we return. And then the base and the end, I guess, are what we need to remove. That makes sense. And then we break out. And that's because we have an iterator going. Then here, we're gonna match allocation. Uh, here we have if let. If let syntax actually didn't exist when I wrote this. So if let allocation was successful, remove the range from the range set, and then we return the pointer. And in this case, we're going to return sum this. Otherwise, uh, allocation failed. And here we return none. Uh, if this is equal to allocation. This is actually map. Allocation.map, self.remove. Um, yeah, I guess that works. I agree with that. I don't think it really helps too much with clarity. Uh, but yeah. Um, remove the allocated bytes from the range sets. And then here we have the pointer. Uh, return the pointer we found. OK. I'm actually OK with map here. Um, yeah, this logic checks out. So you're going to map that. 
Turn none if it failed. Too much magic or question mark? Question mark here doesn't work too well. I mean, yeah, we could map it out, but I think this is good. We're going to map, remove that, return that pointer. I don't know if that hurts, like, code bloat size. If let is equal to allocation question mark. Yeah. I don't know. It's actually kind of hard to say. A couple ways to solve that. Um, actually, I think we can return it here. We couldn't do this in Old Rust due to lifetimes. Uh, Old Rust wasn't smart enough to see that this break was, uh, or return out from this location is final. But New Rust is unable to find allocation. In this case, we can literally just do this. Um, self remove. We have it borrowed up here, but Rust is actually smart enough to know that this is no longer re entrant. Um, we have the non lexical lifetimes. So we can remove. Uh, what's the syntax for that? We have to make a range. Base end end. And then here we can return some pointer. Uh, in this case, it is, oh, we need to compute that. That's the pointer. So return the base plus the alignment fix as a U size. OK. Yeah, non-lexical lifetimes are so huge, man. Yeah, this is much better. I agree. I, I couldn't do this before, right? And this is why I like rewriting and rereading all of this code, because I literally could not do that before. <laughs> I had to like move it into that temporary, and this is so much better, and this will compile much better too. Even though the compiler should be able to be able to see through that closure of the map, uh, it should be, like this is much easier for the compiler to reason about. So. There is one thing that we could technically do here that would be kind of next level. Um, we could potentially have this go through the range set multiple times to find the smallest allocation to fulfill this allocation. And that sounds like it makes no sense because the size is always the same, but this alignment fix is not. So what we could potentially do is cause this to go to try and find which current range needs the smallest alignment fix up to satisfy the allocation. Um, while that's not too important for, for this base case, it actually is relatively useful in the, um, it's relatively useful in the allocating pages case because there's gonna be some ranges in the E820 that are um, page aligned just by nature. And this will cause us to actually use the first one that we see, even if it's not aligned. So I think, I think I might do that. It makes it slower, but I don't care. This is the physical, this is the physical memory allocator. This is where physical memory gets pulled out of physical memory for the first time ever. So let's see what we can do here. I'm going to actually change some of the symbology here. And we're going to say um, uh, require usize bool. And require usize will determine um, from the provided range set uh, with a line requirement for alignment. OK. Um, if require u size is true, then this will only return an allocation which fits within the current u size. 
And then here we just add this. If require u size, then that's a new constraint. And now we can basically allocate things. Uh, we can allocate something out of 64-bit memory uh, without being 64-bit. So in our 32-bit bootloader, we could potentially allocate 8 gigs of memory if we wanted to some reason allocate that and then pass that on to the next uh, stage. I don't know if we're actually ever going to use that, though, because we wouldn't be able to address and thus initialize or zero out that memory. So even if we're creating page tables, that makes no sense. So yeah, that's pointless. Uh, thanks. Thanks, guys, for that clarification. There's no situation where we want to return that because we wouldn't be able to access that memory. And if we can't access the memory, what's the fucking point? We would just be reserving it at that point. And I don't think that's something we're going to hit. Uh, which then means this returns a U size. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> okay. If the size is zero, return none. If there isn't only one bit set, basically it's not a power of two, return none. Create a mask. If it's one, worst case scenario, the align mask becomes zero, which means this is an and with zero, which means we don't have any alignment requirement, which means we subtract off zero from a line, and we get one minus zero, and then we and that with a line mask, and we get zero, and the line fixes zero. Okay. Logic checks out. So... I think what we want to do is we're actually going to go back to the old model because I think we're forced to. Um, let mute allocation is equal to none. Allocation equals sum start uh, start or base and pointer and uh, at this point end will always be size will always be non-zero so yeah there will never be an underflow on this so what we can do is say, check that this has the room to satisfy. If it does, then if allocation is none or allocation, uh, the existing allocation, gross, 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 Uh, and minus base, or or uh, let the previous previous size uh, compute the best allocation size to date. Okay, then here we're gonna say. If allocation is none or prev size unwrap, that unwrap is now safe because it's no longer none at this stage of the if statement. If the previous size is greater than and minus base. If it's equal, we don't do anything about it. Uh, update the allocation to the new best size. Um, Okay, so we're going to map that, compute that. It'll be none if it's none, or the previous size is greater than the current size that we can offer. That basically means that the alignment fix is lower. Then, here we can get to the end, allocation.map, base end pointer. <laughs> we're kind of back to what we had before, but we actually add added very little code here to get the same, um, to get this new semantic, which is actually really cool. I'm happy with this. So we return the pointer on success. 
And in this case, we will do a self.remove range uh, start base and technically I don't need the colon end there because it's the same name. I remove this range, oops, remove this range from the available set. And then return out the pointer. So this will find the best case scenario. Uh, yep, yeah, and that's a tuple. If map existing greater than new, unwrap or true. Yeah, I like this a little bit more. I do recognize that that has the same impact, but I think this is just a little bit more straightforward. I don't know. I think, I think, let me, let me see how, it, let me see how it looks. So the new, we don't have that yet. So we have to do map, um, oh yeah, this would be a uh, previous size map, uh, previous, if the previous is greater than yeah, it's a little bit confusing because the unwrap or uh, you have to think about like which one is none and which one's true, and you have to think about like none means true versus none means false. I've done that a little bit in some other code I've written recently, and I think I've found that I don't like that syntax too much. This I feel like this reads a little bit more straightforward. If it's none or the previous value is greater than the new uh, the new value that we're offering. I do recognize it's the same thing, and it's probably, I mean, it's about the same amount of code. Uh, but it's a little bit confusing because you have to think about inside the closure, what do you want to be true or false? Do you want none to be false? Do you want none to be true? And then you have to unwrap or that, and then you also have to do the conditional inside to match that. It's just, it's a little bit confusing. Maybe if I did it more, I'd get used to it. So it's hard to say. But I think this is fine. Uh, Varial does not need to be mutable. Yes, on that. Uh, range set. Um, correct. You don't need to think inside the closure. You need to think of the about default value when none, which is unwrap or yeah. Okay, we've got the range. Got the range set. Everything has document comments. We converted all of the uh, C style comments. We made some cleanup to the code. We actually improved some of the abilities of this code base that now we can, now it, it'll it potentially save a couple bytes of alignment. But hey, I love that. I love that. I love that it's like finding to the byte what is the smallest amount of memory that it can use. Remember, this is only used when we grab things out of physical memory for the first time ever. Uh, once we get into the kernel, we'll, ever, we'll never actually grab anything out of physical memory greater than uh, or less than a page. Everything that we're going to grab is going to be page-sized. We're never going to free back into this, although technically we can. We can implement free by adding an insert where we insert it back into this. So we could actually implement a free pretty fucking easily, to be honest. All right, you guys ready to see uh, see this bootloader get fucking nuts? You ready to see an allocator pop into fucking existence? Check this out. All right, check the CF for an error. Now, we need to actually go through this twice, <laughs> the E820 twice. So we're going to start off with a range set that is, yeah, we do need to go through this twice. So let mute free memory is equal to range set new. That's going to create a new empty range set. Nothing is in there. We're going to go through this twice. The first time we're going to go through, um, 
And we're gonna see if we can kind of clean this stuff up a little bit. And do I have debug on this? I think a lot of this stuff I don't actually have debug implemented intentionally uh, to save a little bit on some of the overhead there. Free could create too many ranges by creating little slices. That's fine. Well, kind of. Like, we're not going to free more than 32 things, but yes. <laughs> yes. We could definitely run out of ranges. Um... But it's very unlikely. And we're probably not going to implement free because free is a little bit dangerous. Anyways, if the type is one, if the entry is free, uh, mark the memory as present, uh, as free. And we're going to do this by going uh, range uh, free memory dot insert. And then we have a range. We got to pull that in. Uh, and here we'll do if the entry type is one and the entry uh, size is greater than zero, then we'll do free memory dot insert. And we're working in U64s here for everything. So we're going to insert range start entry dot base. End is going to be entry base checked add. Uh, checked add entry dot size minus one. That size minus one is fine because we make sure that it's greater than zero here. So size minus one, that's fine. And then here we'll unwrap. And at that point, we've inserted that as free memory. So we can now go free memory dot sum. And this should give us uh, pretty much the same print that we got before. And here we can unwrap it because we made it return an option with the try fold. And here we go. Uh, it's more. Interesting. I wonder if this is not 100% deterministic. So there's some bytes that are unaccounted for in the previous one where I just added up all the sizes. How did I get how did I gain memory? Um hex ox this plus ox this plus ox this Four four five twelve. How how did what is that difference? Exactly four K. I don't think my range set has a bug. I'm pretty sure I tested my range set. Like, I, I literally fuzzed my range set previously. Um, insert. Base plus size minus one. Unwrap. I don't think I require alignment. Yeah, I don't do any alignment stuff here. Then sum... End minus start, checked add one. Add that to the accumulator. That's scary. It's exactly 4096. But how? How? How is that possible? Uh, 
I should be able to derive debug for these, and I don't think it costs anything unless the code is used. Yep, it didn't use a single single byte more. Okay, uh, for and in free memory dot entries print hex ends. Um, and debug. That's different. What? Maybe it's changing per boot. Maybe we're getting slightly different per boot. Because we weren't printing the E820 entries in that case. Let's reboot it, see see if we get it. Four one six. Isn't that the same as what we saw before? Let's take a look. Zero to nine C three FF. Okay. One hundred to BFF39, let's uh, double check that one quick. Hex OX this plus this. That's free. BFF3B. Ooh, BFF39. Okay, I think it changes slightly based on the. What editor, editor are you using? This is Vim. So I don't think it is non-deterministic per boot, but I think it will vary based on the, um, I think it will vary based on the uh, size of the executable. Like this might change it. Just adding those A's there might change it. Uh, might not have been significant enough, but I think it changes, like we, we have a different range here than what we had up here. So I'm pretty sure we're fine on our range set code. And I'm pretty sure we're fine on this code. Okay. Yeah. Let's run it again. Yeah, those definitely look correct. And we'll print the entries here. And I'll print it hex. But yeah, we're just checked to add size minus one. Like it's zero. Yep. This one. Yeah, we have a slightly different. This is BF E3A. And yeah, BFF 3A and then minus one. BFF 39 FFF. Yeah, we're definitely doing it right. So this is how much memory we have free. And I, I guess iPixie might be grabbing some shit from us. Um, or maybe the like PCI bar is getting mapped at a, a slightly different location. Really hard to say, but that looks correct. We got a little over 10 gigs. Uh, yep. And we lost 1.16 megs. Now, we got to do a couple things. So we've only gone through, E820 is not necessarily, uh, <laughs> it's not necessarily exclusive ranges. It should be, but that's not always the case. So the next thing we have to do is we have to subtract off any non-free ranges. So we're gonna do this by um, uh, four, um, Uh, let's say like add free mem in true false because we have to iterate through this twice 
So here's what we're gonna do. Add free mem, that's gonna tell us this. If add free mem and, so if we're adding free memory, if we're in that first stage, the first iteration of the loop, we're adding free memory. If we're adding free memory and it's free and the entry size is greater than zero, then we insert that as free memory. Otherwise, if not add free mem, if we're not adding the free memory, so we go through once and we accumulate all of the free memory, and then if we're not adding free memory, and the entry that type is not equal to one, and the entry size is greater than zero, um, so this is, if the entry is free, mark the memory is free. If the memory is marked as non-free, remove it from the range. Now this hopefully would do nothing, but in some BIOSes it does. In some BIOSes it'll say memory is free, but also used and reserved. It's fucked. Uh, so we just do this out of habit. We make sure that we assume worst case scenario. So we take the free memory and then we subtract off all the non-free memory. So we make worst case scenario. Um, so we're gonna subtract entry.base and the end. So we're gonna remove this. And we just have to ref this. So we're gonna say loop through the memory, the BIOS reports twice. The first time we accumulate all of the memory that is marked as free. The second pass, we remove all ranges from this free set. Uh, we remove all ranges that are marked, that are not marked as free. Uh, this sanitizes the BIOS memory map and make sure that any memory marked both free and non-free is not marked free at all. Is that clear? I think that's relatively clear. Set the continuation code to zero for the first E820 call. We're gonna go through all of the entries. We're gonna get to the end and then we're gonna print the set. Uh, Continuation we're not using, regs and entry. Honestly, kind of all for zeroing out the entry every time here, just to be careful. And the register state? No, the register state we need to keep along. Allocate a register state to use when doing the E820 call. Create a uh, range set to hold the memory that is in use, uh, the memory that is marked free by the BIOS. Okay, and this is an E820 entry. We're gonna move this here. This is a raw E820 entry uh, to be filled in by the BIOS. Okay, we're gonna get rid of the unsafe, and we're gonna dramatically reduce the amount of unsafe code we have here. Uh, unsafe really just needs to go around this, if I'm not mistaken. And now we have a dramatic reduction in the scoping of our unsafe. In fact, that's the only unsafe we have in our entire bootloader now. Beautiful. Reset. Okay, and it's the same It's the same range, which makes sense. Uh, this BIOS seems well-behaved. Most uh, virtual machine BIOSes are well-behaved because they're written in a higher level language. Uh, BIOSes that are written in hardware are often, for some of those things, written in assembly. So they cut a lot of corners. Whereas in a higher level language, it's easier to make sets and dedupe and handle those sorts of things. So on the first pass, we insert free memory. In the second pass, we remove non-free memory, and then we're at the end. And at this point, we have the list of all the free memory on the system. Perfect, to the byte, to the exact byte. Now, we have to remove some stuff. We have to remove 
what is used by the uh, bootloader. Because if you see in here, it says zero to nine th C three FF is available for use. Well, that's not true. Um, our bootloader is actually in that range and our stack. So we're gonna make some room for the stack. I think we can get by giving us like a uh, couple hundred bytes for the stack. So probably like 1K is sufficient for our stack. So let's see what we can do here. Um, we got that range. What do we got to do next? So we'll do free memory remove range start 7C00 end 10,000 hex. It's not real yet, but I'm just doing that to see if this works. It should. And we should see that we have less memory and that also fragmented it. Uh, we now have start here and here. Oh yeah, we have a range at the end. So zero to seven BFF is available. And then since that was an inclusive, we removed that last byte and now we have this range available and that fragmented that range. Perfect, that worked exactly as expected. Not surprised. I've been using that range set code for a while now. Um, so we wanna remove the uh, code and data used by the bootloader. And we actually wanna get this information from the bootloader. So we're gonna do this or from the stage zero. So here's what we can do. We can say, um, bootloader size is equal to this minus this, this. I think I can do that. And I can pass that as an argument. So we're gonna push D word bootloader size. And I think that is the correct calling convention. We already set up the stack, we push that, and we should have bootloader um, size. That's gonna be a U size, it's a single argument. And let's just make sure this works first. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We're just gonna make sure we have the calling convention right there. I'm pretty sure we do. Uh, print argument is x bootloader size and we'll reset this quick Pew. argument is that ooh okay is that not the calling convention here Really? Um, object dump d build bootloader i release bootloader exe vim dash entry. That sets up the serial port. Push D with that. Oh, uh, yeah, because if I want to use that calling convention, I got to call. I got to call this if I want to pass an argument because it's jumping over, it's skipping over the return address. So I'll call entry point. Okay, so now this should print the one, two, three, four. Yep, there it is. Okay, well, glad we made a check, right? So then bootloader size. Let's see if that's getting passed up correctly. Uh, four, okay, OX458C, 
17804. 17804. Fuck yeah. To the bite. The exact size. Okay. Well, it's always based at 7C00. So we just know that. So now we can subtract OX7C00 plus bootloader size. Don't need to check that ad because that's a very trusted value. Uh, as U64, oops. Move the code and data used by that. And then we gotta subtract one. So that plus the bootloader size minus one. Pew. And there we go. Now we have the bootloader removed and we can immediately use the byte, the byte after our bootloader. Uh, but we still have issues because we have a stack here. We gotta remove. So um, remove some space for the stack. In this case, we'll remove the end address for the stack is 7C00 minus one. And we're gonna say the stack will start at, I don't know, 7,000. Is that a lot? 3K? Yeah, it's huge, man. I don't need to reserve that much for the stack. That's nuts. 1024 hex is 400, right? Yeah. Uh, 7C8. So that will give us... That'll give us 1K for the stack. God, this... Now that brightness is affecting me, too. Uh, 7C00 minus OX400. Hex that, it, it's 78, yeah, okay. Remove some space for the stack. 10 for, for bytes, perfect. So that'll make sure that our stack doesn't get fucked. And at this point, we now have 77FF, 0 to 77FF, free to use. Go ahead, fucking use it. Now, we might have to remove the IVT, the interrupt vector table. Otherwise, we won't be able to go re-entrance on our bootloader. Uh, we won't be able to do a... If we allow allocation of zero, then we will overwrite the interrupt vector table, which means we'll never be able to use a real mode interrupt again, uh, which is going to be a bad... That's going to be bad news. So I think we want to mark the IVT as well. So in this case, the IVT... Quite frankly, what do we use up to? Pixie is separate, so we don't have to worry about that. We can remove, we could remove the whole IVT, or we could remove just the IVT entries that we care about, which would be, uh, how do we get the Pixie code? AXVP, what in in 1A. Uh, let's go to helppc.net core 2k.net. I'm going to see what like the deepest uh, interrupt table we might use is. These are DOS. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, DOS. I think everything below uh, 20, this is BIOS, but I think everything above 20 and beyond is DOS. Um, one F. Yep, that's technically BIOS. And I think that's DOS. Consider using the dark reader add-on. Yeah, I probably should get that. So I'll need access to Pixie again. And 
And for that, I'll need access to 1A. Uh, let's see, memory map. So this is the IVT, right? Oh, it's also saying the BDA is available for use? Fucking crazy. The BDA is where I have my COM port uh, things. And it's saying that that's available memory. The BIOS is telling me the BDA is free. Uh, so I think we'll remove that. This is fine. That's up to our bootloader. And then here, it's your boot sector. And then here, it's guaranteed free for use. Up to here, which is the extended BIOS data area. That doesn't matter if we're not using it. Um, video RAM and shit, that will be removed for us. Extended BIOS data area. Maps, blah, blah, blah. It's not standardized, does not contain data that your OS will need, but you must do a bitewise pattern search to find some certain tables. Oh. It might have the, um, that's where it's probably gonna have the ACPI tables. Oh my God, is it gonna mark that as free? So one trick that does work uh, is I can literally mark everything below the first meg of memory as uh, not free. It means I will throw away probably like half a meg of stuff that I could use. Um, but yeah, there's the EBDA is yep variable sized. If it exists. It's almost immediately below that. Let's see what we got. Let's take a look at one of the original maps. Um, this is saying F000. Really? I think we might be fine. I think we might be fine. Um, so marks that is in use, but it doesn't give a lot of that BD, the extended BIOS data area, it doesn't mark a lot of that as free. So the BDA we need to clear out because we're using that, the IVT, but yeah, we don't actually have access to anything in that range. I guess technically this is saying it starts at 80,000, but um, this is saying that we can use up to 9C400 so technically we can use into that range, but since it's variable length, uh, I think it stops probably right where that data area starts. So I think what I might wanna do is, I might wanna find where the ACPI tables are, but yeah, plug and play, that's gonna, it's like all the ACPI shit. Uh, upper memory, blah, 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 free, pot potentially map shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so we're gonna need to, rem we removed ourselves, we removed our stack, and then we gotta remove uh, up to four FF. And that gives us the IVT and the BDA. So we lose a little bit there. And then remove the BD, uh, the IVT and BDA. 
being marked as free. So that's 0 to 4FF, I think. Yeah, 4FF. And then everything beyond that, I guess that's guaranteed free for use. So we remove this, we remove this, we remove ROS, and the EBDA uh, we're kind of banking on kind of banking on the fact that the that it's not letting us overwrite that, although that 90 is pretty close to the 9FF. 9FFFF. I guess that's a couple couple pages off. DEF. Yeah, it's like uh, 20K or something in there. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. That could be the ACPI tables. Okay. So we remove the IVT and the BDA from being marked free. So technically, if we never use the BIOS again, or we, uh, we can reclaim those things, but we're actually going to use the BIOS uh, because we're going to implement something called soft reboot that will allow us to reboot over the network without actually rebooting the machine. So now we have... Yep, start, end, and we have all the holes and everything should be implemented. So a test for that would be um, unsafe uh, core pointer write, uh, what is it? Where's my Rust docs? Damn it. Okay, Rust docs, and we'll go uh, pointer. Write bytes. It's mem set. And that writes similar to that, but it count number of elements. Okay, that's fine. So we're going to do uh, int dot. Uh, Int dot start as mute u8. We're gonna write a, a 4 1, a nice 4 1 right in there. And then we'll do int dot start, int dot end minus int dot start plus 1. So that's going to fill all of the free memory with uh, A's. Um. As you size, that's going to be on the wrong one. Uh, this is potentially not going to work because we're going to have uh, truncation on these. Yeah, because we have some memory past the 4 gig boundary that we can't write to. Um, yeah, there we go. So it's pretty unhappy about that. Not too surprised. No big deal. So we'll say if int.start... Actually, if int.end is greater than... This is just temporary. If it's greater than... Standard uh, core U64 max as U64. If it's less than or equal to. If this entry fits inside of a U size, then convert it to a pointer and fill it with four ones. Still triple faulting. I don't like that. Um, val count. Yeah, that's a little concerning. Let's uh, let's remove the first meg of memory. Uh, 1024, 10, Okay. Yeah, there's something in there I can't write over. There's something in that first meg that I can't write over. Even though it's free. Really? Really? 
Well, that's kind of what I expected, is that there's probably going to be some shit in there that the BIOS is not telling me. The BIOS is literally telling me I can use all of this. <laughs> it's literally telling me I can use all of this. And, uh, yeah, uh, that's, a, that's a fat no. <laughs> so... Let's see. Let's see where it is. First 256K. That's fine. Something pretty early on there. Interesting. What the fuck would that be then? First one 28K? That's fine. 64k? That's basically where my... It's closer where my kernel is. Wow. Wow. Ah. Uh, 32k? Okay, it's something really early on then. What the fuck would it be? 4K? First 4K? Okay, it's something beyond 4K. That binary search life. Uh, that's failing at 8K. 12K? Nope. 16k was working though, right? I might just remove the first first meg of RAM. Okay, 16k does not work. Looks like 32k works. Alright, let's go... Uh, 24 we're bi we're binary searching this shit it's something in this range 30 30 to 32k nope it's before there okay so 30 29 to 30. We're get we're getting there. I wonder if it's iPixie. Because iPixie has to be persisting somewhere. I think it's iPixie. Because uh, that has no way of updating the E820. I mean, technically... Technically... Pixie should be hijacking that E820 and basically filtering it through. So, like, the way that you can update the, the memory map is you can basically overwrite the interrupt vector, and then you can handle it, and you can, like, cause it to return certain ranges. So you can filter the E820, and then you just... If more and more people keep hooking it, that's fine, as long as they call down into the stack. So, but here we have... Checksum, blah, blah, blah. Uh, code segment address. Must be set to zero when removed from memory. 
Okay. Reload segment offset to the pixie structure. Only present in the API version if the API version is uh, 2.1 or greater. Yeah, we would have to subtract that off and mark that as not free. I think we're just going to nuke the first meg. Because, like, we don't really know if Pixie's going to play long nicely. So I think that's what we're going to do. We're just going to remove the first meg. Uh, remove the first one megabyte of memory for use. The BIOS does some weird stuff. We can't really trust the memory map in this area, especially with op option ROMs potentially using some of this RAM. Okay. So we'll nuke that. That also means we can get rid of this parameter. Kind of sucks. Just throwing a throwing a meg in the trash, but we kind of we kind of have to. I mean, look, like we tried it, right? We literally used what the BIOS told us was free, and we wrote over it, and it triple faulted by writing to it. So clearly, the BIOS is not being accurate, uh, which means either someone has reserved something in there with a special meaning, or the BIOS is lying to us or wrong. Uh, basically, in all those cases, we can't trust it, so so we won't. Okay. Arguments is that. Get rid of that. Perfect. Now we can reset. Yep. So now we just have these two ranges. Everything after a meg for a shit ton, and then everything after uh, four gigs for the rest of memory. Hi, what's the fastest way to spawn processes that are going to be fuzzed? Pupin is painfully slow. Maybe fork? Um, assume you write your first fuzzer in C++. I mean, it really l relies, it, it depends on your environment, right? If you're writing your fuzzer on Linux, fastest you're going to get is pretty much fork uh, unless you implement your own Linux emulator. Ultimately, there are no good setups for spawn processing fast in any conventional operating system. They don't exist. Uh, you pretty much have to do everything in user land. So if you want to fuzz something effectively, try to hook it, try to rebuild it, try to hook it in a way that you don't have to start the process every time. If you have to start the process every time, fork is going to be your fastest bet, but it's still slow and it doesn't scale with cores. Uh, which means you're basically forced to write your own operating system, write a custom driver, or uh, emulate everything in user space. It's pretty much all you can do. So, unfortunately, it's kind of how it is. So, OSs are just not set up for fuzzing. Spawning processes is really slow in every OS. Um, and we'll probably, tomorrow when this kernel is up and running, we'll probably show like the fastest you can actually spin up uh, processes and kind of go through how fast you can actually do it based on the limitations of hardware, not the limitations of operating systems that put global locks on every fucking thing uh, and do a lot more than is required for a fuzzing process, like a very thin process. So we'll go through probably some of that tomorrow uh, for sure. So, uh, let's see. Uh, we need an allocator. So, to get an allocator, we need to implement global allocator. It's relatively simple. Um, I might just need to find the code for this. Yeah, let's just go find the code for it in, um, sushi roll bootloader source main.rs 
Here we go. We've got a global allocator. Cargo run. Perfect. Yep, no such thing. So we'll do struct global allocator. We're going to reformat a lot of this code. We're going to move a lot of it into uh, modules pretty shortly. We're just going to get all of this stuff working. Then once it's working, we're going to move it around. Uh, global alloc, this requires... Uh... Uh, SP, and then global allocator. We have to implement global allocator for it, I think, is what this is complaining about. Yeah, okay. So here we implement an allocator. We're going to implement global allocator for global allocator. Uh, we're going to do, we have to implement alloc and free. Panic, no free, no alloc. Okay, and that is coming from uh, use core alloc, global alloc, and layout. Okay, perfect. So we have alloc and dealloc. I'm not using layout yet. Okay, so now we can do um, extern crates alloc. Ooh, alloc air handler. What the fuck is that? That's new. Let's take a look. Nice. That's new. Um, Next.html. Cargo, rust doc, reference, Namacon, unstable book. One of these will have it. Probably Nomicon. Wow, unstable book. Okay, there we go. It's used like this. Um, may cause this error. Using the alloc crate without the STD crate. Really? Do I have that, though? I feel like I don't. I have oom. And I bet that's what it is. I don't know if that needs to be no mangle. Lang items. Okay, yep. So we're actually going to switch away from using oom, and we're going to see if we can use this instead, because this seems to be what it might want us to use now. So we're going to see. It's nice to not use a lang item here. And we'll see if this gets us everything we need. Looks like it does. So layouts, core alloc layouts in this case. This is alloc error. Nice. Okay, so let's do, uh, let's make a, um, let foo is equal to alloc vec vec new foo.push5 mute. And we're going to do a dynamic allocation. This should fail because, you know, because we fail. Uh, panic, no alloc. Nice. Okay, so we're going to make this return null. Uh, core pointer null mute. And this is going to test to see if we're successfully, we're probably hitting out of memory now. We'll hit the other case. Perfect. There we go. We hit out of memory. 31. Great. Okay. 
So now we can implement an allocator. And to do that, we need to have this E820 table. We're going to put this range set in a global. So we're going to do, um, we're going to clean up all this in a minute. Don't worry. Static uh, pmem free. This will be a range set. And it'll be a range set new, which will be wrapped in a lock cell. Lock cell new range set new. Perfect. We have no lock cell. Use lock cell lock cell. Uh, bootloader cargo toml. We're gonna grab the lock cell in here quick. Lock cell. Lock cell. Perfect. Meet you. Yep. Uh, core pointer null mute for now. That should this should build. Perfect. So now pmem free. No longer gonna be free memory. This is gonna be free memory is actually gonna be equal to pmem free lock. There we go. So now we're updating a global. And then we're gonna to wanna to scope all of this stuff. So let's go, let's start making files. Bootloader source mm.rs. This is gonna be the memory manager. We're gonna implement a couple different things. So we'll have, we'll have alloc, global alloc. This is our, oops, our allocator and our panic handler. Um, we're gonna have a global allocator here. That's the actual global. And this is the free memory list. Get that from range set. Lock cell we're gonna need up here. Uh, and then this. This is gonna be Let's paste that shit as fast as we fucking can. And it range sets. Nice. Okay. We're gonna grab the lock and we're gonna do our stuff. We're gonna call this pub fn and we'll call mm init. We're gonna have mod mm. Okay, uh, register state and all these things. We're going to want to shoot these over. Um, to be honest, we're only doing the BIOS calls. Yeah, we need a uh, bootloader source. We need another thing. This is going to be um, real mode. Here we go. Yeah, I'll put this in real mode. Pub register state. Pub FN. Fn, clean these up a bit. Uh, mark all of these pub. Uh, replace one two three four spaces with a one two three four spaces and a pub space. Okay, all those fields are now pub. And do I want real mode or real under mode? Mod real mode, real under mode. Yeah, one word. Okay. So this we're going to use real mode. Invoke real mode. And register state. This is from crate. Beautiful. We don't have print. Uh, print comes from use serial print. Okay, so initialize serial ports, initialize the memory manager, and we should be good to go. This should run. It's going to fail out of memory. Beautiful. Okay, so we're going to do bootloader source panic. And this is going to have the panic handler. Paste that into here. Uh, we need panic info. Great. Oops. Use serial prints. 
And then here we'll use uh, mod panic. Okay, so here are all the features that we use in our entire project. And extra create alloc. Print, we can't find print. And that's in panic. Uh, use serial print. Beautiful, and we're not using it here. Let's delete it for now. Okay, so this is our bootloader code now. Much cleaner. Still, same effect. New code, same great taste. All right, initialize the serial port, initialize the memory manager. The memory manager, we're gonna initialize here. We're gonna go through all the free memory. Um, that's just initializing everything, which we don't need to do. And then here, I'm actually gonna do a, um, I'm gonna do an option range set. And this will allow us to put a none in here. Nice. And this is the all uh, physical memory, which is avail available for use as reported by E820 with uh, the first one megabyte of memory removed. Okay. So this is going to initialize the uh, physical memory manager. Uh, here we uh, here we get the memory map from the BIOS via E820 and put it into a range set uh, for tracking and allocation. We also subtract off the first one megabyte of memory to prevent BIOS data structures uh, from being overwritten. So we're going to get the free memory. Here we're going to assert free memory is none. Uh, attempted to reinitialize the MM uh, memory manager. Attempted to reinitialize the memory manager. Uh, make sure we've never initialized the MM before. So we're going to make sure that that option is none. If it's not none, we will panic, so assert that it's none. At this point, we can say let, uh, we can say free memory is equal to sum uh, range set new. Uh, create a new empty mapping for memory. In fact, we're going to do this. Let me free memory is equal to uh, pmem. We'll say this pmem here. If it's none, assert that it's none. Free memory is equal to range set new. Uh, create, create a new empty range set for tracking free uh, physical memory. Then at the end, we'll do pmem is equal to sum free memory. Done. Beautiful. So that's going to go through, set the continuation code, raw E20 entry, um, create a zeroed out E20 entry. Okay, we're going to invoke real mode. So uh, invoke the BIOS for the E820 memory map. Check for CF. If there's an error, error on E820, error reported by BIOS on E820. Then here, if the entry is free, mark it as free. If it's reserved, remove it from the list on the second iteration. Uh, on the last entry, we break out of the loop. The loop continues forever. And we go through add free mem true and then false. And then we remove one meg of memory, the first meg of all physical memory, and then we set that up as the initialized physical memory structure. Okay, 
So at that point, that means that we can now do allocations by getting access to pmem uh, by doing pmem free dot lock, uh, get access to physical memory, and then here we'll do pmem dot allocate, and we'll do uh, layout dot size, layout dot um, align, if I'm not mistaken. And then here we'll say if let sum allocation is equal to this, we will return uh, uh, we can actually do this um, unwrap or zero as meet u8. Okay, um, yeah, and this is going to be, um, map x, x dot allocate that, and that's actually, we want to flat map that, so we want to do, um, and then. Okay, and then that's found a U size. Yep, U64 as U64 for the layout and align. So here we're going to allocate if PMM is present. Uh, oops. If PMM is present, then we will allocate the size and align specified. If that fails and or PMM has not been initialized, we will have a none value here, in which case we'll unwrap a zero, which will turn into a mutable U8 pointer, which will be null, which will cause an allocation failure. In that case, we're gonna say mute x here. Um, okay. Are you still doing this? I'm awake now? Hell yeah. Good morning. We're almost we're almost there. Uh, okay. Serial print. Where's that? Uh, mm. Yeah, we're not using that. Perfect. Choop. Okay. Uh, we don't print anything. So check this out. Now we can print foo. Uh oh yeah. Uh, use serial prints and, boop. and here we go there we go we got a five which was allocated on the heap fuck yeah and it's just a vector and we can just push it to that we can just do whatever we want we can push it we can push a 10 we can do foo dot remove element number two we can do whatever the fuck we want now We've got full access to, uh, oh, we don't have freeze, so that's really unhappy when it's going to realloc. Uh, so we're gonna do this. Get access to physical memory. We're gonna do the same thing. And then we're gonna have some fragmentation issues, but uh, it shouldn't matter too much in this stage of the BIOS. Uh, here we actually are gonna wanna panic, I think. So what's amazing about Rust is we actually get the uh, size and a line back during dialloc. Unlike free, where you only get the address and you need metadata to figure that out, we actually just know that from Rust. So we can say um, if let sum, yeah, we'll do pmem and then mute x and then we'll do x dot uh, insert pointer uh, insert range set range start pointer as u64 and then end this will be pointer let end is equal to pointer as u64 uh plus layout dot size as u64 and here we'll just have the end and then minus one Um, uh, we have to worry about zero size types here. 
But that's going to insert it back into the memory as being free. Expect uh, cannot free memory <laughs> without uh, initialized mm. Okay, uh, in this case, this could pass a zero size type there. Let's see here. What about trait pointers? Well, a trait pointer is going to be wrapped in a box, which would be like a heap-based uh, variable, but that everything is going to be sized. At the end of the day, everything's sized until it's no longer sized, in which case there's a length associated, and that length will be included in there. Um, we'll try it out. We'll, we'll do a box. We'll, we'll box something up. Uh, in this case, expect this. And then, I think, and then we can actually do all checked operations. Um, we might need to support uh, zero size types by adding one. I'm not quite sure, but let's uh, let's see. We'll do this. Uh, checked add. Layout size, checked, uh, and then we'll sub this. Checked sub one from that. So we'll get the pointer. We'll get the layout size. We'll subtract one safely from it. We'll safely add that, and then we'll insert that back into the set. Um, yeah, we can't support this if it's a zero size. So here's what we're going to do. This will be size is u64 minus 1. Checked add. That's fine. Um, we either need to promote sizes up because we can't remove a range. Since this is an inclusive range, we can't actually express a zero size range. Um, so we could do. We can just do this for now. If layout.size is equal to zero, return. And we'll be like really, exp I, I like doing this sometimes. Uh, return out for zero size types. Uh, or we have nothing, nothing to free for a zero size type. And we're going to test this. We're going to make a zero size type, and we're going to make sure that it does hold up. 34. And then, uh, in this case, we can just do a map. Um, can't use that in a closure. Oh, yeah, I do need that. Uh huh. Yes. Since I'm using the question mark syntax on these checks. Okay. So this would fail to free if we don't have initialized MMU. This is fine. This should work. There we go. We got five 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 ten, and that makes sense. We added five 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 ten. We removed two. Great. And we were able to free that, and that went back into the memory pool. So we shouldn't have lost anything there. Okay, so let's try a zero size type. Um, let mute foo is equal to alloc boxed box new, I think just an empty slice. And this will be a alloc boxed box u8. Uh, oops, slice of u8s. So we're gonna have a box slice that's currently zero. That's a zero size type. This should cause an allocation failure. Oh. Rust might not allocate any zero size types. So this would panic. If we go into alloc with a zero size type, that would panic. In this case, if the size is less than or equal to zero, we would exit. Maybe we can't make zero size types. Struct foo bar. Let's put a foo bar in here.
maybe Rust never actually allocates for a zero size type. In which case, we don't have to worry about it at all. In which case, I want this to panic. Uh, checked sub one. I want that to fail hard then. So we're going to get the pointer, convert it to U64. We're going to add the size, minus 1, and that's going to be the end. And if the size is 0, that will underflow. That'll cause the failure. That will cause us to hit this panic. And then in this case, that'll cause a panic due to an allocation failure. OK. Nice. Okay, um, yeah, so that's it. <laughs> Lock physical memory. If we have access to physical memory, allocate layout and size, or size and align. Uh, on a free, we want to free checked add size minus one to get the inclusive end. Make the inclusive, insert that back into the free set, return sum. Everything here is protected via locks. Uh, this makes sure we don't double initialize. This will panic if we call init twice on mm. So if we do mm init twice, we should get a panic here. There we go. Tried to reinitialize the memory manager. It's just a. It's nice to add like little uh, fail safes in your code like that. Asserts cost nothing. Just put them in there. Okay. And then. Yeah, and then we have a panic out of memory on out of memory. So this is just a um, just empty structure that we can implement global alloc for such that we can uh, use the uh, global allocator. OK. And here. Uh, the global allocator for this is uh, for the global allocator for the bootloader. This just uses physical memory as a backing and does not handle any fancy things like fragmentation. Uh, use this carefully. It's going to stay 32-bit. Uh, oh, fuck no. We're going to 64-bit as soon as we can. 32-bit's awful. Um, OK, and then this is uh, uh, set up the global physical memory state with the free memory we have tracked. Perfect. OK, and yeah, we can uh, we can do this. And we can also do strings now. Check this shit out. Uh, let mute foo is equal to format apples this. Make a fucking custom dynamic string based on foo element number two. Print foo. Uh, and we got to pull that in from alloc. Look at that. Woo! Look at that. Dynamic strings. So we can do dynamic strings. We can do boxes. We can do vectors. We can do B-tree maps. We can do B-tree sets. We can do whatever the fuck we want. <laughs> so, hell yeah. All right, so now we have access to literally all of Alec. And if you're not familiar with Alec, um, once you get alloc in Rust, you have access to pretty much everything you need. <laughs> uh, so if you look at the alloc trait, here's what it provides. It provides the box, which is a heap allocated uh, fixed size, or not fixed size, but unresizable thing. The RC type, which allows uh, ref counted things. Uh, we have the arc for atomic ref counted, so we can do globally, atomically ref counted things that will get freed once no one else is accessing them. Uh, yeah, we get borrow, which I think gives us, that gives us access to the cow, the copy on right. 
Uh, we have access to box, which is uh, the boxes. We have access to collections, which gives us... We have binary heap, B-tree map, B-tree set, linked lists, and uh, DQs, so, which are ring buffers. We have access to uh, strings, RCs, dynamically sized slices now. Um, these extend string and sync and some other shit. Shit, we get the vec macro, we get the format macro, which allows us to make strings. We have full strings now. Uh, arcs for atomic ref counted things. It, it like to me, once you have lib core plus lib alloc, you have literally everything I would ever use in Rust. Yeah, you don't have hash map, but you have B tree map, which is pretty much the same in 99% of situations. Um, so yeah, now we can make uh. Like, look at this shit. We're a couple lines into our kernel, or into our bootloader, and check this out. Let mute map is equal to uh, uh, alloc collections b tree map new map dot insert five u uh, eight. We need to strongly type it at this stage, uh, and we'll point it to like I don't know fifty. None of this makes any sense, right? Eight. Thirty-nine. Five U thirty-two. It doesn't fucking matter. I'm just making things up, right? Uh, print, and I can pretty print this whole thing. I can just, I can just pretty print it. <laughs> Here we go. Here we have a dictionary now. <laughs> it's like, what? Like... It's so fucking easy, man. Rust gives you, like, everything. It's so nice. Look at that. Three lines into our code base, and we, uh, and we have that. Excluding all the shit that that stuff does. <laughs> Alright, I'm gonna hit the head. I'll be right back. And we're gonna... We're gonna download the kernel. Using Pixie. And... Then... We're probably going to jump into 64 bit mode, and then I'll probably call it for today. Can you sign PMM addresses such as uh, graphics buffer at that and safely access it? Uh, I do not. I go by the uh, whatever the E820 table tells me is available and free. So I, I cannot safely access that, uh, but I could make an abstraction that would allow safe access, and that could be done via um, core slice from raw parts mute OXB800 uh, as const U16 and then uh, 80 times 25 unsafe. So creating that slice is unsafe. I'm basically saying this memory is valid for this many elements. Uh, let screen is equal to this. And now I can do this and I can say screen uh, dot iter mute dot for each x x is equal to o f uh, 55 i don't know what character that is but we'll write it and this needs to be mute so i have to do the unsafe to make that but at this point it is now safe and i can iterate over it and whatever i want to do so there we filled it with use uh and then if we did an out of bounds access uh 80 times 25 plus 50 is equal to 5. That'll build. And then we build, uh, run it. And we get a panic. Index out of bounds. Length is 2,000, but the index is 2050. So. Have the physical memory manager manage those. I'm not planning to use any of those devices. Um, and also, I'm not going to manage those in the... Um, this physical memory manager in the bootloader is mainly just to get the E820 table while I still can call into the BIOS. Uh, I'm going to... Basically, I'm going to... I get the E20 mapping to find all the free memory. I then accumulate that in a set. I then use that to allow allocations temporarily in the BIOS directly out of physical memory. And then... Uh, I will use that to dynamically allocate the buffer that will hold the kernel and dynamically allocate the pages that will be used to hold the page, the virtual pages because we'll start constructing the 64-bit page table. And then we'll transition into 64-bit. And then once we're in the actual kernel, I'll worry about walking through PCIs and grabbing the bars and setting up the memory regions and those 
So this is mainly just to get that free memory mapping such that I can make a dynamic sized allocation of the kernel and then pass the physical memory free state to the kernel and then the kernel will identify the device maps. Don't forget to set up your interrupt table before jumping into 64-bit. It's not actually required unless you're taking an interrupt. Um, so like right now I have interrupts disabled. In fact, this kernel will probably never have interrupts enabled. Uh, I really have no reason for interrupts. Um, everything I need to do, uh, I can do uh, with polling. So I'm not a huge fan of interrupts. Interrupts are useful if you like are building a real OS that's gonna have tasks and threads and context switches and scheduling and preemption, but we're not gonna have any of those. We're going to, we're literally going to spin up all of the cores on the system and they'll start executing from the entry points and then we'll differentiate those based on their core identifiers and they'll do work and they'll do math. And then when I want them to do different math, I will rebuild the kernel and then hit the reset button on my computer and then I'll be fine. <laughs> so yeah, there's not, there's not going to be, uh, there's no user interaction here. There's gonna be no way to type. There's gonna be no shell. There's gonna be no keyboard input. There's gonna be no serial input, nothing. <laughs> this OS just processes data. That's all it's for. It's just so I can get raw access to hardware for perf. <laughs> That's literally all I do. <laughs> it's, it's literally the only thing I do, man. <laughs> I do very special designed uh, kernels, but I have written a TCP, an HTTP stack that goes on a 10 gigabit NIC, uh, and I did that all without interrupts. So to my knowledge, I really have no reason to actually use interrupts yet. Um, I totally understand where interrupts are used for real environments, for real operating systems that have preemption in these things, uh, but we're not gonna do any of that shit. <laughs> I know exactly what I wanna do with this kernel, and this isn't, I'm not trying to re remake Unix. I'm not trying to make an operating system for people to use. This is literally, I just wanna write a kernel driver, but I don't wanna write a driver because I don't want the operating system to get in the way. <laughs> I don't understand how you can use range set without an allocator. Well, range set actually is all fixed allocations. So if we look at bootloader um, or shared uh, bootloader or range set source lib, uh, the range set is a fixed array of 32 entries. So if we were to fragment our physical memory or the physical memory map were to have more than 32 entries, we would end up panicking. We wouldn't end up crashing. We wouldn't end up going out of bounds or doing something weird. We would just end up panicking. And we can test that by just going, uh, setting that to two. <laughs> I swear to God, if I'm not right here and we triple fold, I'm gonna look like a fucking idiot. There we go. Index out of bounds. Oh, that's on the, that is, Oh, we had the index out of bounds and then we had a range set failure uh, because we tried to drop an allocation, I'm guessing here. Let's see. Doop, 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 doop. Yeah, so we got too many entries for range set on insert, which makes sense because there are too many entries. So the way that we would do that is if we had a system that needed a much more complex memory map, we would change the uh, 32 number into a 64 number, and then we would be fine. And then we would complain because Rust can't express things greater than 32, but we would be able to do that with a, uh, uh, we can actually do that with a constant, um, const generics. So anyways, yeah, so basically everything in here should panic and fail uh, in a human readable way if it fails to work. So yeah, the next stage is we're gonna we're gonna uh, ask the BIOS where we can find the Pixie interface, and then we're going to uh, try and download a second stage kernel via Pixie, and then we have to write a 64-bit virtual memory. Uh, we have to write a page table like allocator and 
walker because we need to be able to construct a page table for that next stage. Uh, it's hard to say if we're going to get all the way there tonight. Like, I might want to just go to sleep right now. Um, but we're... It'll take, like... It'll take, like, 30 to 45 minutes to write something that will construct page tables. It'll take probably an hour and a half to write something that will download the next stage. So we're like two hours away from jumping into a 64-bit kernel. Um, and then since a lot of these libraries we already wrote generically, uh, we'll actually get an allocator the second we hop into um, kernel land. So probably, I don't know. This might actually be a, a good place to call it as, as my view count gets the highest fucking amount it's been. I always stream at the weirdest hours that, like, by the time Europe starts waking up, I'm stopping my stream. But I'm always streaming a little bit too late for U.S. times. But I don't know. I feel like it would probably be safer for me to go to bed now than ruin my sleep schedule. Because I worked hard to have a relatively normal sleep schedule. Uh, and we're probably two to three hours away from running a 64-bit kernel. We're probably, after we're running a 64-bit kernel, it'll take us an hour to write a virtual memory manager that will allow arbitrary allocations with arbitrary fragmentation. And then, honestly, we probably just start a hypervisor at that stage. Like, there's really not much to do in the kernel. So, yeah, we're probably uh, pretty fucking close to that. So let's get all this commit up. We're going to add, uh, get add shared and bootloader. Gets, oops. Get status. Uh, we got the config, new file, assembly routines, mm, panic, real mode, cargo, uh, for all the different libraries we added. We didn't add any... Binaries, which is good. All right. Um, Prince, welcome to the fun. Welcome to... What the fuck did I name this project? Chocolate milk. And then here, uh, we'll do let mute data is equal to vec 50 data.push5. And then we'll print that. And that's like, look at that. We got heaps. Uh, cargo run. Vec, we got to grab that from Alec. There we go. Welcome to chocolate milk. And then and then you see a dynamically sized uh, uh, heap allocation there. Okay, so get status, get commit am. Uh... Uh, bootloader with uh, physical memory manager. Memory manager. Manager. And, oh yeah, we got to bring on multiple cores tomorrow, so we have to actually walk the ACPI tables to identify the, like, topology of the system. I actually want to do that in a clean way because I'll need that for my CPU research. Uh, I'll need to know explicitly what cores belong to what physical packages and their affinities to each other. Um, so we'll be doing that tomorrow. In fact, tomorrow, yeah, getting kernel execution and 64-bit and bringing up multiple threads after walking ACPI tables, uh, might put us at a good eight-hour stream tomorrow. So, okay, so bootloader with physical memory manager and... Uh, what else did we add during this stage? Physical memory manager, serial port. Uh, cool. Uh, added lib alloc supports. Get push. Okay. Get status, and that should be everything. Unless we get ignored something that we need to include, and I don't think that's the case. So if y'all want to play around with this as is. Quite frankly, you could use this as a pretty rudimentary 32-bit kernel. <laughs> it doesn't have virtual memory management. It's all physical, but pretty fucking close there. It's already on GitHub, yeah. It's, uh, 
Let's see, I think I have a link to my GitHub. Um, but yeah, I, I'm just gonna do the responsible thing and I'm gonna wrap it up now. But y'all should follow me here and on Twitter and wherever. Uh, and make sure you come back for uh, uh, future streams. So thanks for tuning in. See you all around.